Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, the topic today is uh, independent living. How do I prepare my youth for living away from home? And I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking you, to you today from the city of Burnaby and respectfully acknowledge that we are located on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Helcomelum and uh, Squamish speaking peoples. Today, um, my collaborators on this meeting are um, two um, experienced social and community service professionals and um, two of the most dedicated and caring human beings that I've come to work with. So Rachel Godin is the, a family services consultant from Bachi, Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion. And Monique Nelson is the director of community engagement from Possibilities. So I'm going to start us off today with um, by reading a little um, excerpt from um, Miss Michelle Garcia Winner, who, who was a recent speaker at one of our meetings. Um, the, this article is entitled uh, 10 Levels to in Living Independently. And she um, updated this article in just in May, 2022. So um, just give me a second here. For many people, living independently doesn't just happen. Okay, so um, for many, living independently doesn't just happen. It takes planning, practice, and patience. Michelle Garcia Winner's definition of living independently means moving throughout one's daily routines without persistent prompts or cues from another person. It involves flexibly reacting and responding to daily demands. In their office, um, they have consulted and interacted with many young ad adults who are considered academically smart, but who struggle to live independently as adults, whether in a university or work setting. Many have been given a diagnosis such as ADHD, twice exceptional, or autism spectrum. Um, at some time in their lives, and others have not, have these diagnoses, they're self-diagnosed self or they have other um, conditions, developmental dis disabilities. Almost all of these individuals report challenges with executive functioning and have had a great deal of, of assistance in the form of prompts, cues, and reminders to accomplish the work required to finish high school. Many are also very talented in, a, in specific areas, whatever that area may be. While they make it through the first semester of higher education, a large percentage are unable to continue after that. Why? Their years of clinical experience in Michelle Garcia Winner's office have shown that intellect and academic abilities are not the problem. Rather, challenges with executive functioning skills, the ability to sustain organization, focus, grit, and daily living practices is the culprit. So she, um, she goes on to say that um, going solo requires practice. So in response to the challenges faced by young adults who are suddenly thrust into college and their work life where the expectation is independence, where, where they may have had no, little or no experience or practice. At their office, they have developed a visual strategy-based framework called 10 Levels to Independence. This framework begins with the most critical areas, sleep, medication, food. And this is an area that Maria and um, Mark will talk about today because they've done such, such an excellent job of preparing their, their daughter for this, um, for this independent living life. And it culminates with academic learning and leisure. Each level of independent living forms um, the foundation for subsequent levels and every level is critical for independence. Michelle Garcia Winner believes that it's never too early or too late to target these critical areas, sometimes referred to as soft skills. She thinks that we should um, begin talking about um, independent, independent living and these particular skills about independence starting in the upper um, elementary and middle age school in order to give students the best chance and practice um, and practice and practice some more to successfully living independently. 
So um, she believes that having the foundation uh, tools for living independently is the recipe for well-being later in life. So with that, I will um, ask Rachel to introduce Marie and Mark. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Marie and Mark. Um, Marie and Mark, age 71 and 67, live in New Westminster. Their 31-year-old daughter is diagnosed as having a developmental disability. She has recently moved to a one-bedroom apartment in Coquitlam owned by Kinsight, who are another service providing agency. Prior to her move, Mark and Marie prepared her for many years to be able to live as independently as possible. This included teaching her important skills such as cooking, cleaning, shopping, money management, personal care, using public transit, and using community resources. Mark and Marie would like to share some of their experiences and the tools they have used during their daughter's journey towards independence. Um, and I have enjoyed talking with Mark and Marie as we prepare for this session, and um, I, I'm really inspired by all the work they've done. So, Good morning, everybody. So uh, we're very happy to be here today, and thank you very much, Joette and uh, Rochelle, for inviting us to this meeting. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet you uh, via Zoom. So I'm going to be giving the presentation today, and Mark is here with me. And when we get to the point where you may want to ask us some questions, uh, we'll be both uh, happy to do that. So just a little bit of family background. We are a family of five. As Rachel mentioned, our daughter is 31 and she has two older brothers who are 33 and 44 and live on their own. Uh, while our daughter is aware we're making this presentation, since she is not here, we've agreed not to provide details that would specifically identify her. Our daughter was diagnosed as having a developmental disability. She is verbal, although at times struggles to fully articulate her thoughts. She has difficulty with math, is mobile, but has some neurological difficulties. She's a person who loves family and friends, art, books, horses, and our pet dog. We are happy to share our own experience preparing our daughter for independence, knowing that everyone's child and your own family's needs may be different from ours. Our presentation is based on a set of themes that speak to how life has unfolded for us all. So we raised our family in Burnaby where our children attended Catholic elementary and high schools. Our daughter received additional help from special education teachers, but she struggled to make friends and found high school particularly hard. Once she left high school at 19, we knew she wasn't ready to look for work. So she attended several post-secondary college programs designed to teach job readiness skills to young people with disabilities. So I say several programs because she just wasn't ready at 21 to look for work after completing the first two-year program. So we followed on with two others that offered similar programs, which included classes and work experiences. The college programs were a great stepping stone for gaining work experience, building confidence, and becoming transit savvy. The college programs also helped our daughter to develop a small circle of friends for the first time. And we started to see our very shy daughter start to build more social self-confidence. Partway through the college programs, Mark and I decided to make retirement plans and we wanted to move to a home and community that would offer all three of us walkable amenities, a friendly neighborhood, easy access to transit, and a house with a basement suite. Which brings me to my first theme. Have a shared dream, believe in the journey, even if you don't know when or where it will end. We all shared a dream that one day our daughter would be able to live in her own apartment with the support that she needed. Our family counselor is suggested that our, daughters, that our daughter work on a poster that grew over time and would have images on it of things she would like to have in her future home. Wait, it was a very large poster that went up in her, her living room and um, she put, she just cut things out and put, put it on, put different pictures on it. And there were things that she was hoping perhaps in the future might have an influence on what her future home would look like. So this was something that was always in her space. The basement suite was our daughter's space. We encouraged her to develop her own personal style in terms of decorating it, organizing it, and buying things like dishes, towels, and sheets in her favorite colors. 
Mark built shelves for her large collection of books, art materials, and DVDs. She, would, she could invite friends over to watch movies and have pizza in her suite. So the themes for the, the next phase of our life were create an environment that builds a sense of ownership and responsibility. And if it feels overwhelming and chaotic, break it down and write it down. So we also let our daughter know that she was expected to keep the suite clean, take out the garbage and recycling and do her own laundry. Cooking in the suite was on a future agenda, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. While she'd been doing chores and her own laundry for years in our previous house, how to accomplish this new form of independence seemed a bit mystifying. After several false starts and by talking things through, I realized that planning the time to do chores among other activities or conversely doing them all at once was just too overwhelming. So I created the, re the weekly chore activity list. So I think that you have that one, Joanne. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Hang on. Okay. It's, it's just an yeah. outline piece. There we go. There it is, yes. Every Sunday we sat down and went through her phone calendar and our family calendar and wrote down what was happening during the week ahead. The chores were chosen to be done on days where there were reasonable gaps to get them done. Not every chore was done every week, some being more essential than others. I did spot checks to make sure they were getting done. And when our daughter seemed baffled about how to do it, I taught her methods to do it, which cleaning products to use, what tools to use, and what clean really looks like. If there ever was a silver lining for COVID for our family, it was that we decided that this was the ideal time to really focus on developing our daughter's skills for independent living. So that's what we did. I wanted to talk a bit about teaching our daughter to cook. And my theme for that process was, if they're not ready, find a creative solution to start them on the path. Although our daughter's suite had a kitchen, there was no way she was going to be using it when we first moved in. She was afraid of the heat on top of the stove, the elements and the oven, splattering grease and using sharp knives. But we knew that if she was ever going to live independently, we had to teach her. Although Mark is a much better cook than I am, we agreed that he would cook for the family while I focused on teaching our daughter to cook. Overall, I'm more patient and I can follow recipes. That much I can do, although the food I make isn't as tasty as my husband's. I found recipe books with beautiful pictures in them that our daughter loved. So she started going through them and starting to want to choose the recipes we were making. So I started by my having my daughter act as sous chef, preparing vegetables with a very small knife on the other side of the counter, far away from the stove. I taught her how to assemble and measure ingredients and modified the recipes to suit her tastes. Eventually I coaxed her to come up to the stove to stir things in a pot by buying some very long pink, which is her favorite color, rubber gloves that reached up to her elbows. We also eventually graduated to using oven mitts to put things in the oven by both of us holding on to the pan. And now, by the way, she's discarded those rubber gloves and she is very confident putting things in and out of the oven. During COVID, we made the decision to move down to our daughter's suite to do the cooking. I spent hours down there continuing to supervise and develop techniques for her to manage preparing different types of food. We talked a lot about healthy and balanced cooking and eating. Since her daughter has fine motor difficulties, I hunted for tools on the internet that made preparing vegetables and other foods easier. She is now a master of making spiralized zucchini noodles, one of her favorites. The next step we moved to was batch cooking to reduce the amount of time our daughter had to cook. She really couldn't manage cooking every day of the week, perhaps like an, someone else might want to do or is able to do. So we made double recipes of everything and stored them in the freezer so that she'd have enough for lunch and dinners during the week. I made up a meal planning a cooking schedule sheet. So that's the next sheet, Joette. Okay, that's up, that's up now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And that included choosing the recipes and creating shopping lists as well. I, I don't have the shopping list uh, here today, but we also have a special shopping list that basically is all divided into categories and just has check marks on it. So it's easy to fill out to, to take shopping as based on the recipes. 
Eventually she began cooking and freezing meals on her own in her suite. So she start, eventually got there. So I, I just went down and said, hi, how's it going? And she continued and cooked the whole meal herself in her suite. When things started easing up with COVID, we began to go to the grocery store and our daughter followed her list with some assistance and learned to pay for them using her bank debit card. Which leads me to my next topic of money management. Prior to COVID, we were giving our daughter monthly allotments of cash divided into envelopes categorized into different types of spending activities such as entertainment, books, foods, drinks, etc. She eventually graduated to using a bank debit card, but of course that has its challenges in terms of managing her overspending and teaching her the principles of staying within a budget. Once COVID struck, we, were, we all learned to do online banking and Mark set up a hard copy ledger book for our daughter to keep track of her spending using a calculator. She was at, she's very adept at using a calculator, but not, uh, doesn't do that well trying to do anything like that in her head. The beauty of online banking is that you can't hide expenditures. So the ledger book was pretty, a pretty accurate tool for tracking budget amounts per expenditure category, such as clothes or going to coffee shops and movies. Our daughter will always need help with her money management, but she has achieved a significant amount of independence in terms of being able to shop for groceries, um, other personal needs and using community amenities. We all know that life beyond family is important to every young person, so we search for ways to make that happen. Which leads to my next theme, you need to build community networks and experiences that will support an independent life. Our daughter's been working at a retail store since 2015. This position grew out of one of her college work experiences. They have been very supportive of her, but the work is seasonal and part-time, so she doesn't get offered too many shifts. To fill her time in a meaningful way, our daughter also held three different volunteer positions. These positions have really helped build her confidence and self-esteem and a sense of commitment and responsibility. Our daughter has thrived living in the small community of New Westminster. She made weekly trips to the library, gym, mall, local parks, coffee shops, and restaurants. The neighbors have all been very kind to her and this community has set the stage for shaping her dream of independence. I know that all of you are super moms and dads, but we all have to find a way to give ourselves a break and to rejuvenate ourselves. My theme here is we all need help, you just have to ask. Mark and I have been married for 39 years and we've looked to each other for support while raising our daughter by dividing our responsibilities and taking on tasks that tap into each of our strengths. My mother and friends have acted as caregivers so we could spend time together and alone. We found a wonderful person who came to live with our daughter for three weeks at a time so that we could make trips overseas and just spend time as a couple. We've had several family counselors over time and they've been a big benefit to both our daughter and ourselves. Our daughter and our family have also had great support from wonderful agencies such as Bocce and Possibilities. Their skilled and talented staff have made such a difference in our lives. I wanted to share one more tool with you that we created and have called a skills inventory. Can you put that on the screen, please, Joanne? Yeah. We have used it to communicate with people who would be working with our daughters so that they could better understand her capabilities as well as her needs. You can see that the header is written in first person I because we sat down with our daughter and asked her to rate herself on the different categories in discussion with us. This tool was also helpful for charting progress over time as well. So I won't go into all the details of this chart. It's 11 pages long, but it is divided into a series of categories, morning and evening activities, self-care, weekly planning community activities, meal planning and preparation, money management, housekeeping chores, and employment volunteering. I hope some of you may find this helpful. So have you heard earlier, um, our daughter is now living in her own apartment with support services provided by Kinsight. This only happened in April, so we're still very much involved. All of us are very excited about what the future will bring for our daughter and ourselves. And so thank you for listening to our story. We'd be pleased to answer any questions. And I guess I'll pass it back to Joette 
I appreciate one of the things that I was going to comment on is the financial part. Once we've all moved to digital, digital, it's less the the money in envelopes. I remember as something I did when I was first on my own a hundred years ago, and um, but it's less vis visual when it's digital. It, oh, well, I wanted to ask you first, Marie, if I could share the um, handouts that you've given with people attending. Yes, if they would like them. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So any questions for Marie? Yeah, no, Anna is asking about the family counselor. Um, Anna, that, so, um, and she had questions about who, who that was and that, you know, was that provided by an agency? How did that work for you? Well, we're actually now uh, just, we've just engaged our third family counselor, we really felt strongly that we needed to have that support to talk to a counselor as a group. Um, our daughter in particular really uh, needed to have somebody else to talk about her concerns, needs or whatever without us being present as well. So um, we actually found the counselor ourselves. This wasn't done through an agency of any kind. And in fact, it was kind of internet research. The second counselor in particular, um, we just, went through websites and, and looked at descriptions of the counselor's uh, experience and uh, style and then we met them and then decided that this person would be very helpful. The thing that really jumped off the page to us when we were looking for this second one um, was that she had specific experience dealing with families with people with disabilities in the family and that, that, that was a great cue right there. But it certainly, that person wasn't recommended by anybody. We found them ourselves. Um, another thing is in our last meeting on motivation with Shane Lynch, he mentioned the value of it not always being the parents. Um, yes, so um, he was emphasizing the, um, the importance of um, both peers and um, and people who are not the mom and dad, and certain we've we've experienced that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly agree that that's that's an important outlet for the child. I mean, young adult now really talking about young adults, not not children anymore. But yes, I think that that is a really important part. It supports the family by having that outlet for for your son or daughter. We've also found, as I mentioned in my presentation, that both bocce and possibilities, primarily now bocce um, still has ongoing, um, we have what's called a co-pilot in, in their terms because they have a, a process called stitch services and the co-pilot um, has been following with along with Julia, for, our daughter for a number of years. And um, that person has been invaluable as well in terms of just providing that direct support for her, um, she's always there, very reliable and very understanding, and and a lot younger than we are too. <laughs> and I think that's that's a big thing as well as having someone a little closer to their own age to to communicate with. Mm -hmm. I suppose the cautionary tale, though, there is that those people change, and it's sometimes really hard to replace them. Well, always is really hard to replace because the search for them for, for one that works for your person is challenging to begin with. But then um, both um, being aware that you'll maybe doing that search over again and that there is uh, some boundary setting there so that your your poor person is aware of that that person might not be there for the long term. So. I agree. I agree that, that we've had changes over the years that are just as you described, and those changes are, are never easy. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think that that is part of life, too, and that's part of learning to be a flexible person. I think, um, Joette, you mentioned the word flexibility when you were doing your presentation yes. at the very beginning, and I think that's, that's one of the areas there that we've always struggled with is, is our daughter, uh, really having a hard time with change. And she admits that that is one of her biggest challenges as well. And we've often had to fill in the emotional crisis that has occurred in when, when these certain, certain types of changes occur. And I don't know if that will ever change for her, 
Um, but it is, it is part of life's lessons. Right. Nate is commenting that change is the constant of life. And he's an amazing young man who's, who um, demonstrates his maturity by understanding that. And I'm, and I'm seeing that in my son too. So it's very exciting. Um, so Laurie's asking how to deal with anxieties. That's a big general question. Um, I think all the various supports that we've been talking about, uh, one of the things that we've introduced into our family is meditation, actually, interestingly enough. Um, we, as a family, use the headspace, not that I'm trying to promote it from, you know, um, I'm not an ad for them, but that's one website we use. And our daughter, um, it has a membership with uh, this particular website that their family use. use. And it's one aspect of dealing with anxiety that uh, we have found to be really beneficial. Uh, it's um, sometimes we've sat just together and we've listened to different meditations, but just sitting together doing that. Uh, we have other other types of outlets have been going to the gym at one point, well, before COVID, my daughter and I used to go to the gym all the time. Um, we have a pet. Now, in a new place that our daughter is in, she's not allowed a pet right now, but that may change in the future. Um, they say pets are very therapeutic, and we think that that's been a therapy. You know, as you mentioned, all the other, you know, supports, counselors, etc. Uh, and I, I think it's kind of a day-to-day -day thing, because uh, dealing with anxieties is not something that goes away. I mean, it's something that you have to give people the tools to help themselves. And we're always talking to our daughter about that. You're living on your own now. You don't feel happy right now. How about going and doing some your headspace? What other types of tools does she have? Well, she likes her artwork. Um, we don't encourage using um, all the electronics and all that sort of thing as a, as a means of helping reduce anxiety, because that is something that I think it just ramps it up, quite frankly. So... <laughs> In our household, we were a little bit of a tyrant when it came. We were we had very strict schedules. Those those uh, screens had to be shut down by a certain time and all that. And I think that's something that young people st struggle with. But I do think that too much of that contributes to anxiety. So there's there's so many different fronts as a parent that you're always looking at. What could be causing them to become more anxious? What are the outlets they can use to reduce that anxiety? And it's um. Kind of an ongoing study in terms of what you can do to to help with that problem. I, I just wanted to add too to that that um, it's not just anxiety with the child or the young adult, but it's also there's also anxiety with parent like within the parent aspect um, because you are very invested in your child and uh, you recognize that they are going through a transform transformative time in their lives. And as you start to let go and allow them to become more responsible and more independent, with that comes a certain level of anxiety as a parent to ensure that, uh, that they're still able to cope. And so I think the anxiety bubble, if you will, can cross over both onto the parents and also to the, uh, to the child. Very well put, both of you, thank you. Sure, and you also then worry about projecting that onto them when you're feeling that anxiety. Monique, exactly. uh, Monique is asking, did you have a parent or professional mentor who, to, who turned you on to this form of planning and support, or have you pioneered this approach? It, it is fabulous in its detail. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think that this by nature, Mark and I are very organized people, that's just kind of how we do things. And I actually was trained as a teacher um, for people with disabilities many, many, many years ago. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I think that our personal skills just led to, to dealing with what's going on in our own home in a way that we would just naturally do. We're planners, we're organizers, that's just kind of how we do things. So uh, yeah, no, it wasn't a professional person that suggested this. This is just something we did ourselves as a family. If there are no more questions, then we'll move on to the video that I'm going to show you of um, my son's living independent experience. We had a very big, um, downturn after high school and it was not uncommon to what many people experience. Um, 
he was, um, I think he felt that he was on a treadmill in high school and always he was in a, he was in at here in Burnaby, he was in Mosscrop after a very different, difficult elementary. Um, then he went on to Mosscrop and, um, but I think for him, it was a, 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 an experience of um, being afraid it would all go sideways. And so there was a lot of tension, anxiety and depression in him through high school. And it was a consequence of really poor situation in elementary. I ended up high, um, homeschooling him for grade seven. And then he went on to a better situation in high school. But there was a lot of, um, of holding back. And so he came out of high school um, you know, at the edge of depression and then later on um, experienced quite a deep depression. And um, a lot of social isolation, again, because he didn't engage because he was afraid of fear appearing different. And um, so there was a lot of post secondary, I mean, post uh, high school graduation um, struggle with who am I? What do I want? Uh, I didn't get the, um, the academic background solidly enough uh, to do some of the things I might have wanted to do. And so the idea of what path was really challenging. So he tried a little bit at Langara, he tried a little bit at BCIT, and eventually put together and at UVic. Um, but then um, through all of that hard work on his part, he completed his degree in political science at SFU, and he's been um, maturing since then and worked as, um, as um, worked as um, the a vaccine administrator, uh, you know, administrator for the BC government here at home online. Then he worked for the city of Vancouver in their dispatch office. And then he got a job, a, a probationary job, which is where he is now with the uh, provincial government um, doing, um, working for the Ministry of Health in vital statistics. And so this, this job is, is still, he's still in probation. We don't know if he'll be able to um, get a permanent job from, the, from this point on, but it's like a training ground for um, putting people into other higher levels of government. And so they really, it's an indoctrination. It's very picky about the details of the government culture. And for a person on the spectrum, it's not particularly easy to understand because it's all um, conceptual. It's all about attitude, initiative, motivation, um, all of those kinds of things, aside from the, and legal liability in their, in their um, transactions. So up and down. And so is that enough, Rachel? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's living independently for the first time in Victoria with this job? Well, yeah. when he was at UVic for the short period that he was there, he was in residence and so no meals or anything. And um, now he's living independently in his own suite. So this is the first time he's lived alone. So I will um, share my screen once again and I'll pull up his video. Son Aaron, who's recently moved away from home to join us and to do, offer us his perspective on what it's like to live on his own. Hello, Aaron, and thanks for joining us. Um, so we'll start by talking about um, why, where you moved to, why, and when. Well, I moved to Victoria in March of 2022 to take a job with the provincial government. The place that I moved to was in Oak Bay, which is about a 20 minute bus ride from downtown Victoria. It is a basement suite with a cooktop, uh, open concept living and bedroom area. It has a fridge, a microwave, there's no, dis there's no dishwasher, but it does have a small sink and a cooktop for cooking stovetop meals, as well as a toaster oven. Okay, and so I thought we'd run through various components of, of independent living. I'll ask you some questions about um, how, you, how you experience those and, um, and what might be solutions to some of the challenges. 
So the first one is the big one, particularly in Victoria, and that's the cost. And um, so currently, you have to subsidize um, the cost of the rent because your, your entry level job doesn't give you enough to cover that. And um, so how we're getting around that are through financial planning. Long term, it means that now we know that your job is likely to continue beyond the six months we thought. It means a necessity to share and to look for a different apartment. So this is the first time, Erin, that you've had to operate on the, using a budget. And we have a, an Excel spreadsheet that we develop a budget. And I just, and the, the intention is that we look at it monthly and we review it to see what adjustments we can make. So how you feel about living to a budget? What are your thoughts? I think it's a good thing. It helps me keep track of my spending so I'm not living beyond my means. And it helps me allocate money for different aspects of my life so I'm not spending too much in one area. And um, do, do you find that when you're about to lay down some money or lay down your credit card, that you're thinking about um, whether or not this is something that you really need or whether or not, or, or does it stress you or does it, how do you feel about that awareness of living to a budget? Well, it's an adjustment because I know that if I spend money in one area, it means I have less in another area, but we live in a world of uh, limited financial capabilities. So we have to make sacrifices based on what we can afford. So I think that's part of growing up is you have to make decisions knowing that every decision has a trade-off. And it's made you aspire to higher paying jobs. Yes. The likelihood is that to continue to live in Victoria beyond the six months, um, you're probably going to have to share uh, an, an apartment. Now, for people on the spectrum, you know, the, the need for any ASD habits like stimming or whatever that you might have, or the need for quiet or um, the need for respite and alone time, that is something you're gonna have to balance if you have, a, if you, um, have to share an apartment. How do you feel about that? I think that can be alleviated by having your own private space. I know for myself, I would feel better having my own bedroom and my own bathroom than if I were in a situation where I had to share everything. So I think it'll be an adjustment, but I think there's ways that you can accommodate the living space to suit your needs. Hoping that we'll be able to end up with a separate bathroom because I know that um, you don't want to be stressed sharing, you know, sharing bathroom time with somebody uh, and getting to work on time. It, it's more about privacy. I, I like having some privacy to myself where I don't feel like I have to be thinking about what I'm doing in front of other people all of the time. Then we would work toward a bedroom that's big enough to have a desk area. Does it, would you like to have a TV in your, in your bedroom? I don't know yet. Okay. I want to be living in a neighborhood that has good public transit connections because it's important for me to live in a community that's walkable because I don't have my own car. Okay, so let's move on to the daily living aspects. So um, some of the ones that, that are obvious are cooking and eating healthily, cleaning, personal hygiene and, hygiene and laundry, and then putting it all together. So I know that um, you like good food and I know that you like, um, that you have cooking skill. How much has it helped you having had some prior experience cooking um, before you moved out on your own? It's, it's very helpful to know what kind of foods you can buy that are affordable, that you can make in large quantities on a limited budget. 
because if you can make bigger quantities of food cheaply from scratch, you save a lot compared to buying takeout all the time or buying really expensive cuts of deli food that tend to be higher priced than if you buy whole foods from scratch. Do you think you're eating healthily? Yeah, I indulge sometimes on weekends when I go out, but overall I try to eat balanced meals with lots of fruits and vegetables. Do you have a cleaning regime? I know you're fairly tidy, but do you have, do you know the bathroom needs to be cleaned once a week, twice a week, once a month? Do you clean as you go or do you have a cleaning day? How are you managing that? I usually clean as I go, depending on how dirty I feel my living area is. If I see that there's a lot of dirt on the floor, I'll vacuum right away. Um, what about um, laundry? In having an in-house laundry is helpful, I'm sure. Um, how often do you do your laundry? I usually do my laundry once a week. Um, so do you, are you showering every day before you go to work? Or okay. Yes. I'm, I know that you tend to get a little bit stressed if you have too many things that you're trying to manage at the same time. Um, so how are you doing that? Is it advanced planning? Is it um, shopping uh, on your way home? Is it a bigger shop on the weekend? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you keep it so that you aren't overwhelmed? Having my own personal shopping cart is helpful because it means that I can do a larger shopping trip on the weekend when I have more time to shop. And that means that I can avoid having to shop at times that are inconvenient for me, like after work or later at night. Do you do a big shop on the weekend? Yes. Um, do you do any advanced menu planning? Do you set out a menu for yourself for the week? Or do you decide on Sunday night, say, three things you might like to cook for that week? How do you, how do you manage that? I usually make a point of cooking a large quantity of food on Sunday that'll last me a couple of days. And then I'll do something else in the middle of the week that will last me a few more days. So I generally have three meals, sometimes two, that I rotate through on a weekly basis. Um, are you missing not having an oven? Yes. It um, limits the variety of foods you can cook not having an oven, particularly a toaster oven because it's so small and it literally can only fit a couple of slices of toast. Have you, have you noticed that your ability to manage um, several aspects of different things has improved since you've been on your own? I think I'm more disciplined than I was when I was living at home because I know that I have to rely on myself to get chores done. I can't rely on anyone else to do them for me. So that means that I plan more in advance than I used to. Mm -hmm. um, now we'll go on to the, the actual reality of working when you're not living at home. So, Again, you've always been one to show up at work on time and um, to, you know, work fully and hard. But is there anything about um, when you're away from your, your family home uh, about needing, developing a rapport with your employer, needing commitments to your employer, um, establishing a support network at work. I'm answerable to the same people. It just happens to be a different job title. I can only speak for the Ministry of Health. I can't speak for other ministries, right. but I know that my supervisors were very thorough in their training and it helped me learn my tasks very quickly. Do you feel that there are um, people that you can ask 
questions of easily yes and um do you feel that they're mentoring you i feel that they're able to answer my questions accurately when i need help do you, would you have any interest in seeking out um other types of mentorship or a career coach or a counselor or anything like that um, if i had the right opportunities yes but i haven't found those opportunities yet okay so building an independent adult social life um, the challenges for asd individuals forming social connections can often be exacerbated living alone especially in a new city um, too much time alone can be habit forming requiring an effort to break or um, and having to initiate activities events etc always alone requires effort so how are you um, approaching that aspect of building your independent social life i try to look for things that i enjoy doing where i know there's going to be other people for example, I like board games and I've been making an effort to go to board game cafes where I can play with other people that enjoy the types of games that I like. You know, one of the things that we've always suggested is look into your past and things that you've done before because you have some built in skill set already. So the idea of examining past interests to come up with a short list of, of thing, interest or activities that you could try that are within your budget, within your capacity and within your capability. Have you um, thought about anything from your past that you've done before that you might like to try again? Yeah, like for example, I enjoy running, so I might join a running group in the future. Okay. Um, the other thing that we've discussed as a family is that friendship building takes time and requires sometimes you just need to keep showing up. It's challenging, but I try to remember that. And what do you find is the most challenging or difficult thing about living on your own? Uh, probably knowing that your, your own support network and the onus is on you to take action to do things because no one's going to be bugging you or encouraging you to do them. You're your own best advocate. And what's the best thing about independent living? Probably the freedom to be able to make your own choices without feeling like you have to please other people or compromise with other people. Okay, that sounds like a good place to end. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions? Oh, I'm gonna check the chat. Oh, Lori saying bravo to Aaron, as do I. Um, Nate saying, I uh, like that Aaron loves taking public transit, which I love doing as well. Well, I have to say that a later development there is that um, I've, because of the social factor and the difficulty of buses from where he lives, Aaron is, I've lent him my car for four months to try and um, take advantage of social interaction over the summer and also to um, hopefully initiate some social relationships that if his job continues beyond that, that, um, that he will be able to um, um, maybe in a, when he doesn't have the car then to do carpools or have enough of a relationship going with somebody that he could um, continue um, beyond, continue with the friendship, even when he doesn't have my card. Anyway, okay. Any other questions for me before we go on to Alexander? I have one, Joette. Okay, yeah. Laurie, go ahead. How tough was it for you to let go and let your <laughs> baby go to Victoria? It must have been stressful. <laughs> um. You know what? Aaron has re has has given me confidence in the end. It's the first part that um, mostly we worry about with Aaron is the social isolation part. And of course, that for him, this job is really important and there's no certainty. And the way they do things in government is that they don't really tell you um, 
you have uh, prescribed performance reviews and you're not given any indication um, a, until you get to that point. So really the challenge will be that we don't know until September whether or not the job will continue. And that's difficult in terms of housing because housing is so expensive. And so does he take a place to live or not? And that's the question. But for but but uh, the job part aside, and the, um, the one, A, I know that it's really important for him to know what's next, partly because that's the nature of him and his Asperger's, but it's also, um, just everyone's desire to have some ability to predict what's next for them. And um, they're, um, they're, um, so there's that. And then the other thing is just loneliness. We worry about that. And that's always been um, the issue because Aaron has, um, I mean, he's very kind and he's very um, willing to engage in conversation with people, but somehow that leap to making those friendships has been very challenging. I think a lot of it is because he holds back because of fear from previous childhood experiences. And so, um, so for him, um, when he's not here with us, he's he piggybacks onto our activities with people that we know. And that is not entirely satisfying for him at this point because he wants his own peers. He wants his own life. And as you said, he wants to control his choices. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, it is a life. It is somebody to talk to every day. And that he has to make entirely on his own. However, in the balance of things, when he says to me something like, the best thing about living alone is the ability to make my own choices, tells me about his maturity at this stage and his readiness for that experience. And so it, it is absolutely time for me to let go. Um, somebody, there was another question. Glenda, go ahead. Hi, just to piggyback on the, the, the loneliness factor, our son, Aaron, <laughs> uh, still lives with us and um, we're kind of transitioning him out, but that's not the issue. But I was going to mention is what's really worked really well for us recently is Aaron just started taking um, tennis lessons and it was something we had to kind of push him into. Was he had an interest in playing tennis with a friend. Um, and then we thought, well, they opened up a new tennis facility here in Langley. And so we kind of got him into level one and they kind of encouraged him to go on to the practice level. And now he's starting to, you know, seek out practice sessions with others and making another area of social connection. So it's kind of important that, you know, maybe you it would be helpful for your Aaron maybe to see if you can find some social thing because at work it's harder to make those connections. You're, you're concentrating on your job and, and you're never sure, you know, um, you know, how people are reacting to you in that. So sometimes I know for most of us, typical people, we would just make our connections at work, but it's not always easy for them. So if they you can find another interest, tennis, something, you know, um, whatever, but a place where you have to work with somebody or play with somebody else. In other words, like going to the gym doesn't always work that way because you're working, you're working side by side at a gym, whereas taking a lesson of some sort, you know, forces you to kind of get to know people. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I took the golf lessons and didn't connect with any of the women that I, I play golf with, but for the time that I was doing the lessons, I made some social, social connections. So it's just, it's just a thought, you know, I know he's got a lot on his plate right now, just settling in, but as he wants to branch out towards, you know, making more social connections and not feeling that loneliness, you know, you have to kind of extend yourself into the community a little bit more too, so. That's what we talked. That's why we talked about with him mining past experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to um, see what you might be willing to try, there are th there are exactly that through experiences and activities that you. That's one avenue. Work is another, but you're right, Glenda. It's iffy because. Um, different age groups, they've you've been with those people all day, they go home to their families, whatever, you know, so it doesn't always um, translate. And then there's the online stuff, the meetups and the dating apps and stuff like that. And that demands that you absolutely have to be thick skinned 
And, um, and interestingly enough, um, Perhaps it has, it, there, certainly there's different experiences between men and women. Women have the security issue, which is uppermost, although men do too. Um, but, um, but for men, it's, there are many, many women that are just s a sliding to the next image, right? And so um, there's, there's, there there are many women who are not motivated to meet with people in person, but really just want to want to chat going on. And so Aaron finds uh, that you have to be, instead of all the self-doubt that comes with, why didn't she respond to my last message? You just have to, you know, be prepared to blow it off. Um, <clears throat> the um, one of the important things we've learned is just show up because what you were describing of you know in your situation glenda of maybe it didn't turn into any any uh, social relationship for you with the golfing group but some, and those side by side experiences in the gym some it does happen over time if you're there long enough um you do start to have conversations with somebody and even if it doesn't turn into a friendship that social interaction brightens your day and so those small wins make a difference. I'm reading this book on the, on, um, the Japanese road to happiness and they say 21 times you have to show up before you can even expect to make those um, interpersonal gains. Okay, if there's nothing else, let's go on to Alexander Monique, please. Hello everyone. And thank you to our previous speakers. This has been a really engaging session. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Alexander. We became friends several years ago when we met at Possibilities Inclusion Art Show, and Alexander's piece was selected um, as an award-winning piece for the show. And at that time, Alexander wasn't speaking. We were communicating with the assistance of a sign language interpreter. So you can imagine my surprise when he rung me up on the phone six months later to ask a question, and I didn't know. So. Um, We've just had a really neat connection ever since those days. We appreciate each other's artistry, and I've had the pleasure of watching Alexander move into the reason he called me to tell me about the TED Talk that he was doing in Langley, which was an exciting development. Um, and then I've invited Alexander to speak to family groups before, and he shared his story of how he once lived in a group home, and now he's living on his own, um, we got to celebrate your first apartment together in White Rock, your home community. I've now had a chance to meet your wife and your son. And there's just a lot of inspiration to share with you all today. And then give, with no further ado, I give you Alexander Magnuson. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I always get so embarrassed when she tells me that. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I remember. Okay, yeah, so I fast or backward like a million years ago I graduated high school in uh well I graduated 12 years completion and then get out uh there was I've never actually had a letter grade in my life um if I did it would be all F so I'm kind of thankful I didn't have any letter grades um I was the definitely the child that was deemed to fail at everything um I know that sounds really dark, but that's definitely how it was and definitely how I felt is just failure beyond belief. So, um, and I had no self-determination. And if I could take anything, if you guys can take anything away from this, it would be um, self-determination can really, really, really change somebody's life. And at that point, I had no self-determination. I didn't even know what it meant. I probably didn't even know how to say it. Um, and then, um, so I graduated high school. Like, like I said, 12 years to get out. Um, elementary school was the worst. And then I joined the wrestling team in high school and they all hated me, but they all liked to wrestle me because I was a really good opponent. Opponent, So nobody bullied me because I was really good at wrestling, thank God. Um, I did become a provincial champion at my weight class. And uh, so that was one of my first um, areas of self-determination that I didn't know was self-determination. I just... Um, I just wanted to win and I wanted uh, people to stop bugging me. And I figured that if I got in with the wrestlers, then they would one, leave me alone and two, 
they would maybe help me if I had a problem. But I never had any problems, which was really great. Anyways, um, so after high school, I moved into, when did I move? A home share that lasted three days because I hated it and she was very rude. <laughs> Um, she was an old, like a family friend sister and she was really rude and, um, really terrible. So then I moved, um, out of there and I moved into, where did I move into the, oh, the psych ward because they didn't have any place for me. And then I moved into a group home in Nanaimo, BC, uh, like on the island. And I lived there for three weeks. And then, um... I moved to my second group home and I lived there for about four years. And this was uh, a full care group home. Um, there was um, a lot of the other um, roommates of mine were, um, one was um, a couple of them, sorry, excuse me. A couple of them were um, much um, needed more support than I did, um, a lot of them. And I just kind of kept to myself and I just, kind of deemed that to be my life and that was just the way it was and I'm going to have no life and staff are going to entertain me because that's what they were there for and help me along and help me exist you could say because that's all I was doing was existing uh, and then I'll give you the short version of that because I'd like to get into the more positive because my life is so fulfilled um, I moved in I'll give you the very short version so I moved into what was it okay after the second group home, I moved into a third group home, and then I moved into a home share on bank, on, in Surrey because the manager of the group home was moving to Surrey as well. So I was like, I was like, she asked me if I wanted to come with me or with her, and I was like, well, no, I can't do that. And she's like, well, why not? And I'm like, I don't know. So I did, and my mom... My poor mom, she has been through everything. She is a great support to me, uh, always has been, always one to look like this, to go, oh God, what is he doing now? Okay, he, okay, he's still good. <laughs> so um, my mom has always tried to, you know, she's always tried, to, she, she tried to teach me very, very early, even before, like, even like in high school about all the stuff, but it just wasn't sticking because I had no self-determination. I had no self-worth. I had no nothing. So none of those skills that my mom has taught me and that I, I did kind of know all just kind of fell through the late wayside because of my lack of self-determination. Um, and then, so I moved to the mainland and then I was affiliated with a group home in, in uh, Bachi. Um, I was affiliated with um, Port Alberni Association for Community Living uh, for years. And then also Nanaimo Association for Community Living, and then also Samiamo House for for Samiamo House Society, and for about ten minutes about uh, Langley Association <laughs> or Langley Inclusion, I guess it's called now. Um, so I've been everywhere, um, which brings me to my my advocacy life as well as my 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 work now as a community support worker for Milieu Family Services. Um, I've had, I've worked, um, when did I stop? I don't know. At first it was, it was my very, one. so you might be asking, how the heck did you get from there to now where you are now? That is uh, a simple story. Uh, I was at a, I was living on my own, which I should not have been living on my own because I didn't leave my house for a year and a half and probably, and that was way before COVID. So that was, I was pre, I was training for COVID, I guess. Um, um they 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 said they um the association that i was a part of at that time um you know was like hey we don't have a staff for you because they're going to this um conference thing that was like a one day kind of training conference thing and um i was like you know they're like the only option is is you can stay home or you can go with that person to that conference and i was like all right it's better than staying here for the next million years so I decided to go to that conference and I thought it was pretty interesting. There was a lot of other self-advocates there. It was, it was my very first eye-opening thing of, wow, there's people like me that actually, one, get out of their house and two, that are able to speak about their experiences, which I thought was really cool. I'd never seen anything like that ever. I was very sheltered. I chose to be very sheltered 
my my you know people uh my example of like being like independent was dressing yourself so it was very my my I didn't know what possibilities were out there um so then I I was I was walking around just kind of wandering around um and I like to wander around um the only the reason why my camera was off is because I was walking in circles you know getting ready for this um this speech um so uh I was walking in circles just relaxing stimming um, I'm autistic, so I, I stim all the time. I try and hide it, but my wife always catches me, <laughs> which I find funny. Um, so, so there they asked, somebody asked my opinion, and I gave them an opinion, um, and they said, "Wow, you need to share that to the whole group." And I was like, "Well, I don't know what I said. You know, I just kind of said what I said." And then they're like, "No, no, no. You know what you said. You do it, do it." And it was the first time that they actually somebody actually pushed me out of my comfort zone that knew I could do it. And um, I thought it was really interesting. And then I said it to the whole room, but I didn't remember what I said. So I just said something different. And they were like, wow, you need to be a public speaker. And I'm like, a public what? You, you, you see, yeah, you speak in public, you know, and you in front of people and people would pay you to do this. And I'm like, well, who would pay me to do anything like that, right? So um, um, a, a couple of years later, I got into um, public speaking and I became very successful at it. Um, not only financially at that point, I was also uh, a TEDx speaker, um, Langley time uh, twice, uh, Langley TEDx and Langley TEDx for youth. Um, those are on YouTube, just so you know. <laughs> um, and then, so living on my own and then living on my own, when did I fart start living on my own? was yeah no because I, I lived in my I lived in Burnaby on my own which I shouldn't have I didn't cook I didn't clean I didn't do anything I just kind of squatted there you could say and just existed um and then but it was my first example of uh you need to budget money or you won't have any money and like like I said my mom tried to teach me all the skills like all the skills she she wrote up really nice papers for me really nice things to hang on my walls and stuff like that but i didn't pay attention to any of it because i don't know why why would i right right i don't know i just didn't have the sense that god gave me at that point so but um my last name is magnuson m-a-g-n-u-s-s-e-n -S -S -E um so when i did move into my uh, last home share i believe um, I was sick. That was 22 placements, I think seven or eight home shares or something like that. I was so sick of living in a home share. I was so sick of living in a group home. I was so sick of living, being bossed around, quote unquote. Everyone was quite nice, but I just wanted to be able to do it on my own. And I was like, okay, what do I need to do to live on my own? And then it was the simple things like, okay, you need to dress yourself. Okay, done. You need to do this. You need to shower yourself. You need to do this. You, you, all the personal hygiene stuff I learned how to do, um, which I already knew how to do. I just was too lazy to do. But if I wanted to live on my own, I needed to prove it. I felt like I needed to prove it to everyone, especially myself. So that was, again, the self-determination is you have to be self-determined to do it or else you're never going to do it. I had all the skills. I knew, what I, I knew that I could do it. I just didn't have any self-determination. So then I was like, okay, well, I need to be able to cook myself for myself because I need to be able to eat. Even if it's just noodles, you need to cook for yourself. And then um, and then I needed to and then I needed a job because I'm like, well, living on disability is not going to help me get an apartment any faster. So I applied for every caregiving job I could think of and I got shot down all of them. Nobody said I had the experience. And I was like, well, yes, I do have the experience. I have the lived experience, which nobody else had. So then um, I just applied on like on Facebook, mar you know, not marketplace, but Facebook, um, like mom's groups. I was like, hey, I'll take care of your kid. I don't have any experience, but I'm hoping to gain experience. I gained a lot of experience. I worked with seven different families at once. Um, no, I did not have a social life. No, I didn't want a social life at that point. So my social work life was work. And when I was not working, I was literally walking in circles, trying to get ready for my next job. Um, 
So social skills, I'm still not the most social. The fact that I'm married with a child is, she came to me, I didn't go to her, but anyways, just love her. Um, so yeah, my work was my social life. It was my everything. It was my, where I got a variety of food because they would all feed me because it was, they were so nice. Uh, cause I was, um, taking care of their kids. Um, I've taken care of people, um, of all ages that are like very severely aggressive to very severely medically support needs, uh, and everything in between. I've been a guy to just ride the bus with people. I've been the guy to make sure that the people don't have a meltdown in public to not beat up their family members till everything. So I'm very, I have all the experience I think that most people would ever want. Um, I, um, it's, uh, it was, it was really interesting being the other side. That was, that was the most interesting part of me. And I think that's why I keep going as a caregiver is because I was cared for forever. I had staff, I think my first staff I would, I ever, had I was like probably like five years like that so um that was pretty interesting and now um and now I am like I said I'm married with a kid I just applied for we live in our own apart we live in our own like townhouse apartment thing we have to leave that so now we're moving back to Port Alberni my original hometown um and I just got a job offer from like um Port Alberni Association for Community Inclusion or including in Portal Burning Association for Community Living. And um, so I'll be working in group homes there, and I'll probably be working in the group home that I used to live at, which I think is hilarious. Um, yeah, living with living, I, I just it, I just got the news, so I'm still like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Well, right now, I work for um, Milieu Family Services um, with two gentlemen that are very, very aggressive sweet boys but very aggressive <laughs> um and th that's hard because i uh, be having autism myself um other people's emotions can be very hard and other people's um like i need time to stim because i'm i'm a stimmer i like stimming um and i just go to the bathroom a lot and just kind of do you know little stimmies and stuff like that um and then I don't think my son has ever seen me stim, though. I don't know. He probably has. I don't know. But, um, yeah, now now I guess we're trying to teach. My son actually doesn't have a disability. Um, we're trying to, you know, instill that independence in him early on. Like, he's seven, so we have time. But, um, um, oh, I love Langley Association. I know the ED there, and he's wonderful. Um we just moved um, to a different location before we actually got into this the association. But the, yes, Langley is wonderful. All the associations that I've been a part of are um, are absolutely wonderful and tried really, really innovative ways to help me, and really, um, really just amazing. I can't say enough about um, very cool. I know when I lived on my own. Like my mom was, she, like I said, she always was a part of my life. Always, 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 always calling me and always say, you know, you need to save money. You need to do this. You need to do that. And right. And um, for me, it's always, I kind of learned things the hard way. Like I had to be really broke to realize, oh, maybe I should budget. Uh, right. So um, when I was working at CLBC um, and then I was also working at um, CBI consultants, um, as an employment specialist and then CLBC as a strate strategic initiative advisor. Uh, those when I made the most money when I was working at both when COVID was happening. And then of course, not many people were spending too much money. So I was loaded. And now I ain't so loaded anymore because my budgeting sucks. And having a child is like, well, you've got, you guys are parents. Like <laughs> uh, one minute, you know, you, you, you one minute you buy, so many bananas because he loves bananas and says that he'll eat every banana in sight. And then you buy a bunch of bananas knowing that he won't eat the bananas. And then he'll, he doesn't eat the bananas. Being a parent really, it's really something is you don't get time for yourself, not creatively. You got to make sure you're creative. I live a really good life. I live a very self-determined life. 
I teach my son about self-determination. That was the first thing I thought, I, you know, you teach him. Because if you're not self-determined, then all the skills that you want to learn or have to learn aren't really going to do you any good. Alexander, can I ask you a question about, you said you learn by doing things really badly or doing, yeah. or failing at things. And you're not the only person who has mentioned that kind of thing to me. So for many of us parents, we, when we worry that our, um, our people don't have the resilience or self-confidence to come out the other side of failure. You gotta let them fail. Yes, I understand that, but that's the fear that most of us have. Oh, and, of course. Do I get that? I get that. Um, but the, the thing is, when you say that, it tells me that you had a core confidence or belief in yourself somewhere that either was just innate in you or came from that, that constant um, checking in that your mother did with you. Or for whatever reason, it seemed to be something that you always had some belief in yourself that you could pull yourself out of the, the worst situation. What are your thoughts on that? And, um, and any, um, any sense of your, of, of where that strength comes from within you and any guidance you would give to parents about that? Sure, sure. Um, well, me, it was at a time when I did not believe, I, there was a big time, a long time that I did not believe in myself at all, but it was, I need to survive. And that was, it was, I need to survive. Like, I'm also like a Romanian orphan. So I come from Romania. Um, and I guess it was like, if I can survive this or that, I guess I can survive anything. Uh, I'm stubborn. I would say stubborn would be. I just, I can't fail. I choose not to. Now I have a son. Um, I, I certainly am never going to let him see me um, crumble too much because I have a son that's looking at me and I want him to be able to do it. And he knows about me. You know, he knows that I've, you know, um, that he actually doesn't know that I have autism, I don't think. He just thinks that I'm just the fun dad. I don't know. Um, but he will learn. And when he does know, he will learn that he's just seven right now. So he's, he's young. Um, he will, he will know that daddy did everything to make sure that his life was better than mine. I had a very good life, but you gotta, you gotta, you got to be okay for them, your children to fail because they're going to fail. And it's better if they fail a little bit. So then they learn, okay, I can fail and be okay. And then when they fail a little bigger, well, I already failed, so it's okay because I would I picked myself back up. So then they're getting ready for those big failures of like I have no money and I need to eat, or um, uh, I my car broke down. My car, my car, I got into a car crash. Um, I was going straight and somebody turned left and I my poor car kissed it. Um, that was a big fail for me because getting my license was one of the most um, aside to my aside of my son, was one of the most biggest accomplishments I've ever done. So I was because I failed so many times before. I was prepared for it to not just be like the worst thing in the whole world. It was okay. Call ICBC, do this, do that, all that stuff. Um, and now I have my N. I'm going to go for my class four. Yes, going for your license is super difficult. I agree, but get it done. If you want it, get it done. You can do it. Well, um, Alexander, you're unstoppable, I'm convinced. Anyone else have any um, uh, questions? They, Monique, go ahead. I was curious uh, how you manage, there's a, a lot of competing demands on your time, and you've mentioned that there's not much time to stim or self-regulate. How do you manage anxiety and just the daily pressures of leading such a full life? I mean, something I think all of us can connect to, how challenging that can be. Yeah, sure. When, when I first became a dad and had my wife and kid and all that stuff, I would go in car rides and I like in my car and I would bawl my eyes out. I would just cry and stim and cry and stim and stim. Stim and cry. And it was so overwhelming. I think I just like, it was the most overwhelming thing I've ever been a part of. 
ever. Um, it was it was one of those things that I wanted to be that super dad. I wanted to be that super husband. You can't be a super husband or a super dad when you are constantly crying. <laughs> so when I got home, I put, put up, you know, like bucked up and I was like, okay, I can do this again. And then um, I'd have to go out for groceries or something, give go out or something. Uh, we're a single car family. Uh, so I would go out and I'd cry again and I'd stim again and I'd cry and stim and stim and cry. And then I'd come back and come back. Um, now at work, when it's stressful, when it's always stressful because you always get the, the threat of being beat up is always there. I do a lot of bathroom breaks and I just, uh, less crying, more stimming. <laughs> um, and then... I, I've even had mentions of like, sometimes when it's super stressful, some, some of them be like, oh, you're in the bathroom a lot. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, big bladder. I always drink water, which is true. It's not a lie. But in that, you know, um, definitely a lot of stimming. Um, I talk to my mom a lot. I talk to my dad a lot. I talk to my wife a lot. Uh, my wife and I have a very good relationship. My tolerance, I, I guess my tolerance for stress has gone way up. Where before it was like, if I put on the wrong shirt, it would, it would um, screw me up for a week. Where now it's like, eh, I got a shirt on. It's great. Okay, now it's like, what's the real stress? You, you, you find out what real stress is and you get more tolerant with real stress. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then before we go, aside from thanking all of you, I want to share one resource with you um, that, that I can um, take the link from and, and, um, and put in the chat. But here it is. The Aid Canada has a, has, um, a library and um, they, have, um, uh, they have put together this piece called Enjoy My Home, Supported Housing Considerations and Options in Autism and Intellectual Disability. And they identify five styles or approaches to supported housing um, are described along with the rating and estimated levels of support provided, cost and availability of each support. And although this will be based on community and time, um, they, these styles of housing um, describe comprise community living with wraparound supports, semi-independent living with light supports, supportive roommates, home sharing, and community care. So it's worth having a look at. So I will take this and throw this link into the chat for you. Um, and I will also um, email the attendees the, um, the um, uh, sheets, the documents that Marie and um, Mark um, supplied us with. And I would like to thank very much Marie and Mark for presenting for you, Alexander, and thanks to Aaron and Victoria. And um, Monique and Rachel, thank you very much for all of your um, support and um, back and forth on this meeting. So uh, much appreciated, all of you. Thanks so much. Anything else anyone wants to add before we stop? Um, yeah, if I could just say, it, just uh, add my thanks. And, um, you know, one theme I saw through all of the talks was that a gal has called it shared vision, share is self-determination. And um, uh, Mark and Marie were talking about a vision, but that that piece of having that, you know, that, that star that you're working towards that brings all the efforts that you're doing together. Um, you know, that was a theme that I saw and I, it was, everyone was so inspirational. I just want to add my thanks to, to all of you for, um, for sharing your experiences and your wisdom. Likewise, thank you. It's yeah. really nice to see some old friends here coming and going off screen. Um, and feel free to contact us after the workshop if questions come up that we can help you with. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Monique and Rachel, shall I um, throw your emails in with the um, sheets that I'm sending out for uh, the check Mark and Marie's checklist? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm, you know, Bocce Family Services, a Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion, which always gets called Bocce, um, are available to give assistance to families living in Burnaby and New West. Yes. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you in September. <laughs> Have a great summer, Joette. Yeah, thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you.